good morning. Welcome to the Church in the Woods. Um, so glad you could join us this morning. I'm going to wait for people to get signed on live. I know some of y'all will be watching this later, replaying. And um, Cool morning this morning, but it's a beautiful day. Um, I know a lot of y'all are probably getting ready to go to church this morning somewhere. And uh, For some of you, this is the church that you attend, and I appreciate that. I appreciate all of you that join us, and uh, we want to be an encouragement to you and help you today. Let me know where you're watching from. Uh, we're, it seems like we're growing, we're reaching even a greater audience, so it's always great to see where we're, where we're reaching. And I just want to say um, thank you for the prayers. Last night we had uh, seven decisions, um, people that uh, were needing something from God received it. There were some that I believe, uh, there's no telling what we're going to hear from, from the future from what happened last night. God showed up in a mighty way. You know, I got to thinking about that and thinking about miracles. I want to talk about miracles this morning. That's what God laid on my heart this morning. Um, many people are suffering. Many people are going through different things. And there's a lot, you know, we hear about, you know, God doing great things in other people's lives. But sometimes it doesn't seem like God's very interested in what's going on in our own lives. And, and I feel like that's something that uh, we need to talk about this morning. I want to encourage somebody. I want somebody to hear this this morning that, um, God, God is uh, God is going to do something great in your life, mighty in your life. I really don't know a hundred percent of where we're going, but I've got some scripture wrote down and some things that He laid on my heart. And you know, you hear people say, especially, you know, I call it church talk or Christian phrases, whatever. People say stuff like God really showed up and showed out, or God's going to show up and show out. You know. And they're all excited and everybody's happy and God does show up. And God does show out a lot of times. God does show his glory and his power. But there's sometimes in some people's lives when God ain't showed up. He hadn't showed out. Everybody else is celebrating. Everybody else is happy. But maybe in your life God hasn't done anything as far as you can see. You know, there's people with children that are on, that are addicted, that, that are hooked on pills, hooked on all kinds of different things. There's... There's people that are have, facing illness, sickness, um, lost loved ones that just seem God just it seems like God is not is almost as if He's done with them because you don't see Him working, you don't see what's going on, and you know I try to be as real as I can with you today. I, I think if you're trying to appear to be spiritual and trying to appear to be super religious, it's not going to help nobody. We got to get real today. We serve a real God that that deals with real problems, that understands real people. He knows exactly what's going on in your life. He knows, he knows the frustrations you have. He knows the disappointment that you have in him. He knows that you're mad with him. God knows all that. But get this, and this is what I really want to get across. He loves you anyway. He's not mad at you. He's not, he's not frustrated with you. He's not saying, you don't have faith, so therefore I'm not going to work in your life. That ain't, that ain't the God we serve. The God we serve gives us the faith that we need to be saved. Then he finishes our faith. He's the author and finisher of our faith. Has nothing to do with that you don't have enough faith. You know, a lot of people will tell you that, especially these um, ministries that, that want to work off your money and, and, and try to coerce you into giving to them so you can get a healing or some kind of miracle. You can't buy a miracle from God. And ain't no man going to give you a miracle. God is the God of miracles, God of glory. God does what he wants to do when he wants to do it. What we have to do is understand that where we're at is not an accident. What's going on in your life, God has not forgotten you. And that's what I want to speak about this morning. I pray this encourages someone out there this morning. In John, the second chapter, and this is where I want to start at, Jesus was the beginning of his ministry. John, the second chapter, verses 23 through 25. Let me pray first. Father in heaven, I, Lord, I, for some reason, it's just been this way with us that I come out here and I know you've got something you want to say, and I fight against it. I try to come up with some kind of outline or something to stick. But, God, I pray that you just have your way this morning. Speak through me. I pray that they not see me, they see you. I pray they not hear my voice, but they hear yours calling them. I pray for someone to be encouraged today. That person that you've laid on my heart, that person that you're speaking to today that needs a miracle, that's asking you, been praying, been looking, but it has not come. Lord, I pray that you open their understanding in their heart to who you are and what you're about to do in their life. In Jesus' name, amen. John, the second chapter, starting in verse 23, 
The Bible says now when Jesus, when he, Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commend himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Now, right off the bat, Jesus is known for miracles. They just said they, they believed on him because of the miracles he'd done. But interestingly, Jesus didn't trust them. He didn't believe in them. He didn't, want, he didn't commit himself to them. And if you dig a little deeper and look at what's going on, there's thousands of people at a great feast. Things are happening. Things are going on. And here walks in Jesus, proclaiming to be the Son of God, performing miracles, raising the dead, healing the sick, casting out demons, and, and on and on. And he was known for power and miracles. Those people believed on him. Why? Because the miracles that he'd done entertained them. They loved to see him work miracles. They loved to look at him and watch him. They loved to spectate, but they didn't follow. See, Jesus knew what was in their heart. The Bible says he knew all men. He, he understands what's going on in our heart. And he's looking to build faith in the heart, not in the mind. A lot of times we want God to perform a miracle for us. We want God to work something for us. But God is looking at it's a head thing. It's a head knowledge. It's not in the heart. God always looks at the heart. These people were emotionally driven. They saw him doing great miracles. It made them feel good. You know, in, in, in Christianity today, there's a lot of that. A lot of people go to a service or they, they come, to, come to a place where people are worshiping God and they're looking to, to be entertained some. Some are looking for an emotional experience. And listen. We love to have emotional experience. I love that when God touches my heart. I, I love the, the feel of power of God. But I'm going to be honest with you. There's sometimes I don't feel God. There's sometimes when everybody else is having a wonderful time and I'm standing there thinking, what's wrong with me? I don't sense God's presence sometimes. That doesn't mean he's not there. That doesn't mean he's not working in my life. And it certainly doesn't mean he's not going to do a miracle or even working on a miracle for me in my life. Jesus came to do the greatest miracle of all. He came to redeem, redeem mankind, separated and dead to God unto God himself. He came to justify you and me. In the very next chapter, one of my favorite chapters, John the third chapter, Nicodemus came to him. Nicodemus was a very religious person. He fasted, he prayed, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. Very, uh, just a very a stout, very knowledgeable man about the law and about, about the, the, the Old Testament laws. And he came to Jesus. He saw Jesus doing miracles. Matter of fact, he said, the same came to Jesus by night and said it to him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou, thou doest except God be with him. Now, Jesus didn't stop and say, well, I thank you for that, Nicodemus. I'm glad you recognize the miracles I've done. I thank you for, for glorifying me for my miracles. Jesus didn't say that. L listen to what he said. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Wait a minute now. I didn't come for that, Jesus. I didn't come thinking, what are you talking about being born? I come to talk about the miracles you're doing. I, talk about, I want to talk about how everybody's believing on you because of the great miracles. Are you the Messiah? Are you the one that's supposed to come? Because look at the great miracles you're doing. Only a man from God could do those miracles. Nicodemus said it to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, You must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Now, there's times when I'm praying down in the woods and the trees are just bending from wind. There's times when you've been out in the outdoors and you can see the wind bending trees, the wind moving, but you can't see the wind. You see the effects of the wind. Jesus was telling him there's a greater miracle than the miracles you're seeing now. And that miracle is a, the salvation of mankind. That miracle is a born-again experience. It ain't praying a prayer. It ain't getting on the church row. It ain't being baptized. All that's great. I'm not against praying. I pray all the time. I'm not against being baptized. I've been baptized. I've been a member of a church. I'm a member of this church. Here's the, I'm a member of the church, the church of God. The bottom line is this. The greatest miracle that's ever been performed or done was when something that's dead is made alive and new before God, spiritually. Now, I know 
for some of y'all, and probably for that person I feel led to talk to this morning, that doesn't really help you because you've got some problems. You've got a child that's strung out. Uh, you got some, somebody out there, you have a child that's facing legal problems, maybe in jail. I don't know. I just feel it all over me. There's all kind of stuff going on. And you're solid in your faith. You believe in Jesus. You're, you're, not, you're not even like these people I just described. They believed on him for his miracles. No, you've actually been saved. You believe because you've been born again. And you're upset and angry at God because God just ain't answering your prayer. Sometimes you pray and it gets worse. I know how you feel. I've, I've experienced that. Jesus came to do miracles. But sometimes he don't show up and show out. He ain't showing up and show out. Somebody today, I guarantee you, somebody today standing up at church going, whoa, God's going to show up and show out. But in your life, God ain't doing nothing that you can see. So when you walk into that service or you hear that, that don't help you. It makes that person feel good. And I'm not, I'm not talking about whoever does that. That's, it, praise God. Just give him glory, okay? I'm not against that. But I'm just trying to be real with you today. There's people that are going through real problems. And everything ain't wonderful. Everything ain't great in your life. You don't have a full bank account. You don't have, uh, you don't even know what you're going to do tomorrow. I, I preached last night in a church 40 miles from the coronavirus. 40 miles from Raleigh. There's two, I think, two cases in Raleigh of the coronavirus. Now listen, I'm not wigged out about the coronavirus. It doesn't shock me. Why? Because the Bible tells me there's going to be pestilence and disease in the last days. Look, it's here, it's coming. If you don't believe the word of God, all you got to do is read it, read it, and look at the news. It's fulfilling itself every day. There's going to be more. There's going to be more pestilence, more disease, more wars, all kind of things. Hatred is going to grow, a great falling away. All kind of things are going to happen. This place is going to get wild before it's over with. But thanks be to God that the miracle of salvation has come to me and hopefully has come to you. And I'm not a citizen of this planet. I don't belong here. I'm not a U.S. citizen as far as God's concerned. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God, seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus with power and victory in my life, walking with the Spirit of God upon my life in power, having miracle, the miracle power, the resurrection power of God that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power speaking through me, speaking life by the word of God. But that doesn't mean I have the power to perform miracles. That doesn't mean I have the power to ask God, you better do a miracle. That means I have the power to walk by faith and not by sight, that God's going to do it. God's going to show up when God's good and ready, and when he does it, he'll receive the glory. Didn't he come to do miracles, though? The Bible says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth of the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed, and of the devil, for God was with him. Jesus said... The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at naught, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus rolled up in the temple, and he read that out of Isaiah. He's speaking of himself. I'm, I'm the one. I'm the one this is talking about. I'm the one that's come to deliver your child from drugs. I'm the one that's come to set the captive free. I'm the one to heal that sickness, to heal the broken heart. I'm the one to come. And I've came and I've done it. There's a real adversary out there. There's a real honest to goodness devil. I know people say they believe in the devil. People say they believe in hell. But you know what? Lip service don't cut it. Jesus said, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. I can say that about Satan as well. People honor Satan. Well, that must be the devil doing that. The devil must be doing this. We give him a lot of credit, don't we, sometimes? But here's the truth. In your heart, some people don't even believe he exists. You don't even believe that there's a real hell. And you say, well, how can you say that? Are you witnessing the people? Are you going out in the neighborhood trying to win people to Christ? Are you sharing the gospel? Do you have a passion and a burden because you believe there's a real hell and you do believe that people are going to go there? Because lip service don't do it. Showing up on Sunday mornings and praising God don't cut it. Being religious ain't good enough. Being a good person will never get you to heaven. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. And that adversary, the devil, has come to kill, steal, and destroy but Jesus said, I've come to give you life 
and to give you life more abundantly. Now, there's a heart problem here. That's, I feel that's what, where we're going today. There's a heart problem. I don't know who I'm talking to. I'm probably talking to me. There's a heart problem. Up here, I say I believe. Up here, I say, God, I, I've seen you work in my life. I've seen you do miracles in my life, Lord. I've seen you heal some of my family members. I've seen you touch my wife and heal her from a tumor in her neck. I've seen you dissolve things. My wife had a, and I don't guess she'd mind me saying this, it's too late now, so uh, she's behind the camera, so she can't really stop it anyway. I guess she could. On her thyroid, she had what appeared to be a nodule. And um, this was that, I guess I, I was on fire for God and just everything was great as far as my relationship with the Lord. And she said, would you, be, would you pray for me? Would you have the church pray for me? Well, I don't know what happened, but that morning I just forgot. I guess I was just so caught up in the service, I forgot to ask the church to pray. That night, she said, would you get anointed for me? Now, I don't, some of y'all might not know what that is. I know some of y'all do, but we believe ha having people lay hands on us and pray that God works through that. We believe that. The Bible teaches they laid hands on them. We believe in anointing with oil. That oil has no power. That, that oil is not miracle oil, so don't ask for none. I'm not going to mail you no miracle oil or no miracle water. That's hogwash. But the oil represents the spirit. The oil represents it's just, a way that we, it's just a way that we come together in agreement, believing that God's Spirit is going to touch and heal. And I went up there that night for her. I stood up there. I said, I want to be anointed for my wife. And they laid hands on me. And I wasn't emotional. I wasn't worked up. I was actually thinking, man, I wish I'd done this this morning because there were more people here. I mean, you know, the carnal, the way we think, the, you know, we need more people. They prayed for me, and when they started praying, it felt like warm oil coming down my head. I felt a warmness, a warmness come out, and, I, and I, at the same time, it was peace. And it came down all the way down to my feet, and I felt it. I felt it moving, and I, 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 I could just, I knew that everything was all right. I can't explain it. I, all, I just knew that everything was good. After it was over with, didn't question it, didn't worry about it. My wife goes to the doctor that day to have it measured again because it had been measured and looked at. And when they went and measured and took the x-ray and looked at it again, it was gone. Now, I have the report from the doctor that says it was dissolved. It has dissolved itself. I know who dissolved it. God still works miracles. I could go on and on. I could name other miracles. Listen, by grace, I'm even standing here. By grace, you're standing there. There's been times I should have been dead in a car. There's been times I should have been dead in places I didn't even realize I could have been dead. God, sovereign will and plan protected me. He worked miracles to work all things out for our good and his glory. But when we want him to work a miracle, when we want to see him move, sometimes he does and sometimes he doesn't. And it's a hard place to be. It's a hard place to be when you feel like God is not showing up and showing out. God doesn't hear you. I was reading this morning, the Lord led me to John 11th chapter after this, about Lazarus. Some of y'all know about Lazarus. He, had, he, he was sick. Now, Jesus was out doing his thing. He was on an evangelistic tour, preaching the gospel, preaching all over. And word come to him that Lazarus was very sick and going to die. Now, Jesus loved Lazarus. He loved Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sister. Jesus loved that family. There was a lot of homes that wouldn't allow Jesus to stay with him because he was an outcast by this time. He was hunted. He was looked. They, the Pharisees and Sadducees were out to get him. He was close to the end of his ministry. And word come to him that Lazarus was dying. And right there when I read that this morning, I thought, how many times have you prayed said, God, my child is dying. My child's addicted. I keep, I'm hung up on addiction this morning. My child... I, they're, they're not going to live very long if you don't move, God. If you don't come, if you don't come here and do something, they can't help themselves. You can't, you, you can't even show me that you even care because I don't even see you working, God. They sent word to Jesus. He said, okay. He wouldn't go. He, he wouldn't go where they were at. 
He waited two days. And by then, Lazarus was dead. And he told his disciples, he said, now we'll go. Because Lazarus is asleep. And for, I want you to see, the, I'm going to show you the glory of God. This is for the glory of God. This sickness is not unto death. It's for the glory of God. And he shows up. And what does he show up to? He shows up to hundreds of people mourning and crying and wailing about Lazarus being dead. One sister is upset, so upset, she won't even come out to meet Jesus. Martha comes out. What does she say? Lord, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't be dead right now. In other words, I believe in who you are. I know you're God. I know you're the son of God. I know you have power. I'm not upset because I don't really know if you're the man and I don't really know if you're God. I'm upset because you are God and you didn't do nothing about it. You didn't show up and show out for me. And now my brother's dead. That's what she was saying. What did Jesus say? Jesus says, if you believe, you'll see the glory of God. It was time for him to come and do that miracle. And he was taking his time because he was waiting to get to a place in their hearts that they were ready to receive it and God was going to be glorified. Now, I can't explain all of that. I'm not going to sit here and try. But I do know that Jesus, when they took him to the tomb, because he said, where have you laid him? They took him to the tomb. Mary had, he had talked to Mary by then. The Bible says Jesus wept. The shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Now here it is, Jesus takes his time to get there. It's almost as if he doesn't care. But then Jesus cries and groans in his spirit. Why did he weep? Why did he cry? He already knew what he was going to do. He knew that Lazarus was going to die. He knew the day that Lazarus was born because he's God, that Lazarus would die that day. God, Jesus knows everything. God knows everything going on in our lives. Nothing surprises him. And all things are working together. I know that's a verse we throw around a lot, but it's true. All things work together for the good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. All means all. And they're all working together. And he's working things out. The Bible says, for we know that the whole creation groaneth, because Jesus groaned in his spirit. He cried and groaned in his spirit. The Bible says, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain. What is he talking about? This world, man. This world is fallen, and it's groaning. Why? It's groaning for the return of Christ. It's groaning to be set right. Sickness, death, addiction, pornography, uh, greed, jealousy, lying, corruption, on and on. It's all because of sin, a, symptoms of sin, a fallen world. It's not God's will that any should perish. It's not God's will that any should be addicted. It's not God's will that you're sick right now. Nevertheless, because of the world and because of the way things are, we're going to have to play our part through this world. And whatever we're going through, God has allowed it to happen. You can like that or not. I'm sorry. He allows some things to come. They're going to come anyway. There's things going to come. I just told you that Satan's come to kill, steal, and destroy. This world has fallen. God's going to allow things to come. But when he does, it's to show who he is, to show you who he is, to grow your faith, to show his glory, and to do more than I can even think or imagine right now. And we, but we, we'll know that when we get to eternity. The Bible says, and not only they that ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to which the redemption of our body. We groan as children of God. God, where are you? This world's a mess. Why won't you do, come on? I'm tired of the way things are. But yet God tarries. Why does he tarry? Why does he wait? Because he doesn't want anyone to die in their sins and go to hell. The, the simple answer, the reason Jesus is tarrying, the reason Jesus has not come back already is he's waiting for pe more people to be saved. He's waiting for you and I to carry the gospel. The reason your miracle hasn't come, the reason you're going through trials and tribulations you don't understand is God has a purpose. He's waiting for something. He's waiting. I could be a super spiritual guy and I could try to make excuses for God. I could tell you some things that may make you feel better for a couple of weeks or a month or so, but what about when he doesn't show up then? What happens then? See, that's how some of these preachers are. They'll, they'll tell you what you want to hear to tickle your ears. But the truth is, 
God is sovereign and God does what God wants to do. And what God has asked me to tell you this morning is to humble yourself, which is hard, and say, God, nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. Lord, I've asked you to do this. I've asked you to work in my life. I've asked you to show up and show out for me. But God, even if you don't, even if I don't see it, you're still God, and I'm still your child, and you're working all things out. By faith, I believe it. By faith, I stand on it. Because by faith, I'm saved, and by faith, I'll go to heaven, and by faith, I can please you. And that's the only way I can please you. Hope is not on the way. Hope is already there where you're at. Don't lose hope. You're not alone. You're not by yourself. God is not saying, I don't have time for you. Hope is with you. Jesus is hope. Now the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace, believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. You have hope if you're a child of God. If you're not a child of God, you have the hope of being saved. Hope is in the world today, and his name is Christ. Hope hung on a cross over 2,000 years ago, saw your sickness, saw your pain, saw your sin. But yet hope loves you and hope wants to save you, hope wants to deliver you. Hope wants to come in do that miracle that you're so desperately wanting, but hope's going to do that miracle for God to receive the glory. The Bible says, by whom also we have access by faith into the grace wherein we stand. Hallelujah. Thank God for grace. Thank God for grace. We, we talk about grace as if it's just some novel idea. You're saved by grace through faith. Let me tell you something. Grace is undeserved favor. Grace is something God give us that we just don't deserve. Recently, you know how when you're raising children, you have things come up. You have issues. And my daughter, I feel like, deserved to be grounded. Done some things. Typical teenage stuff. And it upset me. And I grounded her. And so my wife, I'm sitting in a recliner, and she comes by. She says, you know, she said, this is a good opportunity to show grace. I said, what are you talking about? She goes, grace. And I will be honest with you, that made me mad. I, she was right, and I didn't want to hear it. I felt, I felt it in my spirit. And I said, I'm going to sit here and be mad a little bit longer. You just take off. I, I don't want to do that right now. I'm mad. I come down to the woods to pray. I come back in the house later. And God said, now it's time. And I go in my daughter's room and I take Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Or I take the Bible and I tell her to read Ephesians chapter 2 to 8 and 9. I said, do you know what grace is? She said, yeah, Daddy. Getting something you don't deserve. I said, that's the same, exact same thing that God done for you and me. Not one of us deserve what we have. We don't deserve salvation. And you know what? You don't deserve what I'm about to do. But I'm going to unground you to show you grace. To show you that you don't have to pay the penalty for what you've done. Because I just want you to know that I'm going to give you grace. And a light bulb went off in her face. I could see her face light up. And it weren't because, yeah, I, I'm, I'm getting my stuff back. I, know, I recognize that look. It was a different look. It was a look of, wow, I understand. Grace has come. Grace will sustain you. Grace is with you. Grace is in you. God gives grace. He gives more grace. Some of y'all out there are lost in sin. You're so vile and wicked. He says, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Grace is available. Hope is available. The Bible says, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. Get that. Hope that is seen is not hope. I don't see God moving. I don't see the miracles. Do you have hope? Hope is something that's not seen. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope,
For that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? Do we wait for it with patience? Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for. I got these scriptures wrote down for reason. I'm tired of praying, God. I'm tired of asking you to fix this. You won't do nothing about it. That's when the Holy Spirit prays for me. God doesn't abandon you. He doesn't abandon me because we get mad, because we get frustrated. He knows we're going to do that. He's allowed it to get to that point. He already knows what's in your heart. He wants you and me to see what's in our heart. And when I can't even pray, this God is so good. This God is so wonderful that when I can't pray, he'll pray for me. He'll do it for me. And the, he searches the hearts, knoweth that what is the mind of the Spirit, because he make intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them which are called according to his purpose. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? My worst enemy is not the devil. My worst enemy is David Page. Lack of faith, lack of commitment, lack of trust hinders me more than anything. Satan is a defeated foe. He was defeated at the cross. If God be for us, who can be against us? I don't know why God's tarrying and not bringing that miracle. But I do know that he is with you. I know his hope is with you. His grace is there in you. I know that you can't even pray about it. Honestly pray about it because you're mad. I, I, I just feel God leading me this way. You're upset with God. You're, you're angry at God. But he prays for you. He's still loving you. You, you may... You may Get to the place where you just say, I'm done. Been there, done that. He's not done with you. He's not going to quit you. He's saying, when you're done with everything else but me, then I'll show you what I'm going to do. Because there's nothing that I want between you and I. I want to be that intimate with you, that personal with you. And when you're done with self, when you're done with everything that you think you can do, when you take your wrench off of it, then I'm coming with all power and all glory. Jesus said, talking about Lazarus to Martha and Mary, I am the resurrection and the life. This man's dead. He stinks. He's in the grave. Been dead four days. He's rotten. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believeth thou this? Believeth thou this? Mary, Martha, David, Beverly, whoever's watching, believeth thou this? The man was dead. Couldn't help himself, couldn't do nothing for himself, and they couldn't help him. God specializes in the supernatural. It's the norm to him. There's nothing impossible for God. There's nobody that's too addicted that God can't deliver. There's nobody that's too far gone that God can't save. God can move in any situation and do anything that God wants to do because he's God. Nothing is impossible for him. We limit God. When we limit God, it's because we want it our way. We want things done now. We want it now. God says, you've got to trust me. I love you. You've got to trust me. Jesus said it to her. That if thou wouldst believe, did I not say that if thou would believe, you should see the glory of God? He walks up to that tomb. Everybody moaning, everybody crying, everybody down. He walks up to the tomb and he says, Lazarus, come forth. I believe if he hadn't said Lazarus, the whole grave, the whole graveyard that got up. Everybody that got up and walked out with grave clothes on. That's why he had to call his name. Ain't you glad God knows your name, hallelujah? Ain't you glad called you by name? Ain't you glad God called you out of the miry clay, out of that dark place you were in? By name, 
He knows the hairs on your head. He knows how many hairs are on your head. He's intimately involved in your life. He knows the very de depths of your heart. He knows the doubts, the fears. He knows the inward things that, that you don't want nobody to know. God sees it and sees even more than that. He knows you. And when he called Lazarus, the Bible said, And he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes on. And his face was bound about with a napkin. And Jesus said, Loose him and let him go. Deliver him. Let go, addiction. Let go, opioids. Let go, sickness. Let go, death. Let go, Satan. Great day in the morning. And the dead man was walking around, took his clothes, his grave clothes off. That's symbolic to salvation, deliverance. Stinking dead, walking around with death. Death took off of him. Give him life and give him life more abundantly. And what do we find in the very next chapter? The very next chapter in John chapter 12, Jesus was sitting at the table eating. Who was sitting with him? Lazarus. The one that he raised from the dead was sitting at the table with Jesus. Hallelujah. We're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. When he saves us, when he delivers us, we're part of the family. And we're seated at his table. Things look bad sometimes. Things get rough. And after this happened, it got rough for Jesus. It got rough for those that were around him. It got rough for Lazarus again. Because he saw them crucify the Savior. He saw them take the one that raised him from the dead and put him on a cross. Whip his back, beat him. But it was all done so Lazarus would never die again. Think about that. Before Christ went to the cross and was raised from the dead, Lazarus still was going to die. But he said, even though you die, and you, but you believe, you shall never die. Talking of spiritual death, that's, that's the whole point. I don't know why God is waiting to show up and show in your life. But I do know, without a shadow of a doubt, that he loves you with a love that you just can't even understand or fathom, and I can't either. And he has hope and grace to give you more. And he wants me to tell you that he is working in your life, and in spite of you being upset about it, in spite of you being frustrated and disappointed in him, he loves you anyway. And you will see the glory of God if you will believe. Let the words of our mouth, the meditation of our heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, in Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah.